Okay. I want to thank you all for being here this evening. I thank you very much for participating. And welcome to uh, a webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. We have presented, been presenting these since uh, the COVID problem arose in March. And we have put on about 150 to 200 of these so far. Uh, if you go on fjmc.org slash webinars, you will see our full schedule. We have many interesting programs coming up. And also if you see something that has already occurred, most of them have been recorded, you can click on view webinar and you'll be able to uh, see it on tape. Uh, it is my honor to introduce Eric Passman of Florida. He is a docent with the Florida Holocaust Museum and very well versed in that. He's a retired IT guy and I tried to, I'm trying to uh, recruit him to work for FJMC at, at a very high pay, of course. <laughs> the same pay I get, just so you know, which is zero, of course. Uh, and he told me that he is a guy who's very passionate about Israel. And we're looking forward to this. And uh, Eric, I wanna hand the floor over to you now. All right. Well, thank you, Alan. Um, so the Florida Holocaust Museum, which is actually based in St. Petersburg, Florida, a um, little unusual because it's, it's not where uh, the majority of Florida's Jews live, um, but it was founded by two Holocaust survivors, um, Walter and Edie Lobenberg, and they uh, wanted to do something uh, to ensure that the, um, the, the memory of the Holocaust uh, did, not, did not go away. So, so they founded this museum. Uh, I've put in the chat uh, the website, so anybody that wants to visit uh, the museum, all of the exhibits are now online. Uh, they didn't used to be, but they are now. Uh, you'll see links to virtual exhibits, and in fact, what I'm about to show you is, is the virtual exhibit of the, the main Holocaust story, which, you know, we're only going to have uh, probably a little less than an hour to cover it, so um, we won't be able to cover everything. And if you want to, on your own free time, go back and take a look, you can actually view not only the exhibits, but they actually have survivor testimonies uh, on, the, uh, on the exhibit as well. So let me share my screen and I will bring up the, um, let me bring up the, hang on, let me find it here. Give me a sec, it's like it's not in my, Okay, we're gonna to have to go here first. Okay, so give me one sec. I can share this one. So this is what you would see when you go to that website and I'm gonna scroll down to, this is the virtual tour of the Florida Holocaust Museum. I assume you can all see that. Um, and here, the virtual tour is right here, and we're going to go to the full screen version. So hopefully, if, if people can uh, nod your head, uh, Alan, can you see? Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, I gave you a little bit of an introduction into the museum. We're going to dive right in, and we're going to talk about anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism didn't start with the Holocaust. It didn't start with the Nazis. It's, it's been around for a long, long time. And in fact, um, while it's not on this timeline, uh, most of us have uh, just celebrated a, uh, the holiday of Hanukkah. And the holiday of Hanukkah, which uh, took place um, in the about 165 uh, BCE, uh, was because the Jewish religion was banned. Uh, you, you were, if you studied Torah, you would be killed. If you circumcised your child, you would be killed. So one of the earliest forms of anti-Semitism occurred uh, during that period of time, uh, which resulted in the holiday of Hanukkah when the Jews fought against it and, and uh, restored the Jewish faith. Uh, if we want to go to something a little newer, we can talk about uh, the Black Death. Okay, this was in 1348, the Black Death, and uh, this was a plague that, that uh, was caused by, by people being bitten by rats. Well, 
Jews were not, uh, not by rats, by fleas that were on the rats. Jews were not affected as uh, in, in as much of a concentration as non-Jews. So the general non-Jewish population began blaming the Jews for the Black Death. And actually many Jews were killed as a result of it, as a result of this blame. Some people speculate that because of the ritual practice of washing and ba you know, bathing uh, on a regular basis, washing your hands before eating and things like that, that that actually is what protected uh, the Jews from, from the uh, Black Death, similar to today with the coronavirus, you know, where they're telling us to, to wash our hands frequently. Um, if we go and look at a couple of more recent examples of anti-Semitism, This is what the exhibit would look like if you were actually at the museum. This is actually a, a French version of a book called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. This book was actually commissioned by the, um, by the Russian czar. This is pre-communist era. So Russia was not doing well. The country was being run very poorly. The people were very uh, angry at the leadership. And so they had a, com they had a book commissioned to basically be written as if it was written by the Jews. And the purpose of this book is to explain how the Jews are gonna take over and destroy the world. And you can see this is a person who's, who's being drawn as a Jew, who's digging his fingers into the world. You'll see lots of bodies underneath the world. You'll see blood dripping out from under his fingers. And this book has been translated into many, many languages. And even to this day is, is still published um in in a number of countries so and and it was again it was done because they needed to to draw attention away from the jewish community uh or, or not away from the czars to the jewish community now in this case this is a uh, nazi poster so this is fa fairly right after hitler took over and the translation whoops hold on i gotta go back the translation you can see is right here. And th this person, Julius Stryker, um, he was the founder of Der Sturmer. Der Sturmer was an extremely anti-Semitic magazine that was used to turn public opinion against the Jews. And we'll hear about Julius Stryker towards the end of the, uh, the, towards the end of the tour. So just keep him in mind, but you'll notice, uh, right down right here um the translation is here jews will not be admitted so this this was all about the jews and the government of of uh of striker um of Schleicher, I'm sorry, jews and the government of Schleicher. so it was all about blaming the jews for all the problems that were taking place in Germany. And interestingly enough, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, they, they usually ask this question for high school uh, tours. Um, they, they ask high school tours, what percentage of the German population do you think was Jewish? Because obviously if the Jews were, were such a cause of the problems in Germany, they must have represented a, a large portion of the population. And the reality is they represented one half of 1% of the population of Germany. So, so let's, uh, let's take a look at what life was before, um, before the Nazis came to power. Give me one second, we're going to. Okay, waiting for this to load. Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, 
So what you'll see in this photo here. So, so this photo here is, uh, it's a matzah factory. There were two matzah factories in Germany. It happened to be before Passover and they had to hire a lot of extra people uh, to bake the matzah because obviously before Passover, that's when the demand for matzah is high. Um, and what you'll see these people, um, only two of them are Jewish. The rest of them are not Jewish uh, people who are working in the matzah factory. And the two who are Jewish are this woman here. She was the owner of the factory. And this was her granddaughter. Uh, and this happens to be Edie, who is uh, one of the founders of the museum. Um, her mother was sick that, or she was sick that day and they didn't want to send her to school. So they sent her to the matzah factory. Uh, that day, and that's happened to be why she was in this photo. But you can see it's just every, you know, everybody's getting along. This is pre, you know, pre uh, Hitler. Um, so you know, world is, uh, it, it, you know, life life for the Jews was was actually not bad in Germany at that time. And then let's take a look here. This is not quite, Hitler hadn't come to power yet, but this is a very important quote uh, in my opinion. Uh, this is a quote from Adolf Hitler in 1921. This is more than 10 years before he came to power. Hatred, burning hatred. This is what we want to pour into the souls of our millions of fellow Germans until the flame of rage ignites in Germany and avenges the corruptors of our nation. So this was what he wanted to do. He wanted Germans to hate. He wanted them to hate so much that they would destroy the people who he felt were uh, were, were were harming uh, the German the German people and the German population. So, how exactly did he get into power? So if we look at this timeline, after, after World War I, the Germans were forced to sign the Treaty of Versailles. Okay, the Treaty of Versailles required Germany to give up territory, and it also required Germany to pay reparations to uh, France and England. Um, so this was, this was pretty onerous, and Germany really struggled at that point. So the, their economy uh, was in failure, uh, life for the average German was not very good. Um, and then, um, yeah, so, so, so there was, there was a, the, eventually the Nazi party got formed. Um, they actually, actually tried to overthrow the government uh, and Hitler was sent to jail. It was while he was in jail that he wrote Mein Kampf. And in Mein Kampf, he blames the Jews for all the problems that Germany, uh, that Germany had. Um, in 1929, of course, the depression came. So not only did the depression come and the economy of the entire world was, was uh, a mess, but France and England thought, hey, we need, we need money now. So let's tell Germany to repay the money that they owe us. Um, and with that, you know, the, the Hit, Hitler's message of Germany for Germans uh, began resonating with the people. And so in, uh, in, in 1932, in July of 1932, the election that they had, the Nazis won the most seats in the Reichstag, which is basically their Congress. Okay, they didn't have a majority, they didn't have more than 50%. So yeah, they still needed to form a coalition like they do, uh, in fact, in Israel, um, after each election. Um, but Hitler was appointed the chancellor of the country because his party uh, had the most votes. So not long after that, uh, there was a fire at the Reichstag, again, the, co the Congress building. Okay, and this, and nobody to this day knows who set that fire, but some people believe it may have been the Nazis themselves who set the fire. So at that point, Hitler was granted emergency powers 
And with those emergency powers, he was able to take over uh, full control of the government. So who was the first people, who, who were the first, who was the first group that Hitler went after? It wasn't the Jews, it was the opposition politicians. So the first group that Hitler went after was everybody that opposed him. So they established uh, camps. So you either, you either agreed to agree, you either agreed to step down and stay silent, or you were thrown in prison. Those are your three options if you, were, if you were an opposing politician. So he took complete control of the government at that point. Um, so let's take a look at some of the other victims. And when I say other victims, we're talking victims other than Jews. So there were in general five different uh, other victims. There were, there were, um, there were uh, the gypsies, which are the Roman Sinti, homosexuals and specifically homosexual men, Jehovah's Witnesses, Poles, and uh, the mentally and physically handicapped. So, so the mentally and physically handicapped, again, they were about a pure race. They wanted every, they did not want the Aryan race, which they believed was a Nordic race to be polluted by anything that could, uh, that, that could make it less effective. So if somebody was mentally or physically handicapped, they wanted to eliminate them from society. So they began setting up asylums where they brought these people to, they encouraged the families to drop, to bring their children in. And these asylums, initially they were sterilizing the children, but in that, eventually what they began doing was gassing them. They put them in vans, they piped in the carbon monoxide into the vans, they drove the vans around, they gassed them, and then they would send a letter to the parents with the ashes, uh, which may or may not have been of their children, uh, saying, hey, we're really sorry, but your child got sick and we weren't able to save them. Um, eventually, the, it became known what was going on and they had to move the, uh, this operation underground. In the case of the um, Roman Sinti, the gypsies, you know, they were out on the street, they were begging, they were considered to be, you know, not as, um, not, not as good or, or as, uh, you know, as, as racially pure as, as the Nazis. So again, they rounded them up and uh, put them in concentration camps, particularly before the 1936 Olympics. They wanted to clean the streets when everybody came to the Olympics. So that's when most of the gypsies were rounded up. Now the one group, one group that was slightly different was the Jehovah's Witnesses and different in the sense that if they signed a document declaring that, uh, that, that they would they would follow Hitler. They would follow the Nazi Party. That you know he was their he was their leader. Uh, they could get out of the concentration camps. They were the only group who was persecuted that could actually get out. But ninety percent of them refused to sign, and as a result, they also were sent to concentration camps. Uh, many of many of them were murdered as well. So, but his real focus, of course, was on the Jewish population. And that was, that was, um, he wanted to, he wanted to basically get the Jews to leave Germany. So what did they do? They started passing laws. They started passing laws against Jewish people. Uh, they were banned from Jewish, uh, they were banned from civil service. Uh, they couldn't be attorneys. Uh, they couldn't collect, um, uh, they couldn't collect uh, government, any kind of government uh, insurance if they were medical professionals. Um, 
And what they, so they did it slowly. They ratcheted it up. They kept passing every year, every month, they would pass more and more laws. Um, initially, they revoked citizenship for, from nationalized German Jews. So if you were uh, somebody from Poland who came to Germany and, and got your citizenship, you lost it if you were Jewish. Eventually, um, where are we here? Eventually, they um, they removed all all Jews were were uh, lost their you know the Nuremberg laws were passed I believe in in around 1935 and all Jews lost their citizenship. Um, you can see Jewish doctors are excluded from collecting from health insurance. Um, and here's, this is the Reich citizenship law, which is also referred to as the Nuremberg laws. When these were passed, Jews were no longer citizens of Germany. Even if they were born in Germany, they were no longer citizens. Uh, a couple of other things, or one that I, I find interesting is right here. So, at this time, Jews had to register any assets valued at more than 5,000 Reich marks. You didn't have to turn it in. You didn't have to give it to the Nazis, but you had to register it. And then a year later, I can find it. Um, here it is right here. Jews must surrender all precious metals and gems. Jews were also re, re, uh, uh, forbidden from changing their names uh, because, you know, if they had a Jewish sounding name, the Nazis wanted to keep it that way to make it easier to find them. Okay. And this all culminated in an event called Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. So Herschel Grinspan, his parents were, were, Polish, uh, were Polish Jews, naturalized citizens in Germany, and they were told to leave. His parents were told to leave. So they were brought to the German-Poland border. Poland would not let them in. Germany wouldn't, you know, wouldn't let them stay. So here they were stuck in a tent in November, which it's pretty starting to get pretty cold then. Uh, and he was pissed and he decided to take action. And he decided he was gonna kill uh, the German ambassador to France. And he went to the German embassy in Paris. Uh, he did kill the third secretary. Um, and he of course was arrested and killed himself. And then two days later, this massive attack occurred on all Jewish property, synagogues, businesses, everything, any Jewish owned property was attacked. And it, it was presented as a spur of the moment um, attack by Germans. The reality was this was a coordinated attack. Uh, clearly it could not have happened in all these locations at the same time. Um, had it not had it not been coordinated, um, what's what's interesting? This is our founder. He he passed away a couple of years ago. Walter, Walter happened to be going to work on uh, Crystal Knock. He worked in a bakery. He was uh, he was thirteen years old, and he got to his bakery, and the bakery was destroyed. The machinery was destroyed. The building was burnt out. It was nothing left. Um, so he went to his synagogue, and the same situation. He, um, he, went, he went back home and uh, told his parents, his father was very sick. Uh, and and when, his, uh, when he was home, the Nazis tried to take his father, uh, tried to arrest his father. As you can see here, 30,000 Jews were arrested on Kristallnacht. Uh, these are, these are uh, Jews at uh, the Buchenwald concentration camp. Um, and uh, his father was too sick, so they didn't arrest him. They came back a little while later, tried to arrest him again. As they were taking him out of the apartment, he literally collapsed. So instead they took Walter, um, since they couldn't take his father. He was brought to a room with thousands of, uh, thousands of men. 
And um, when they asked him his age, they told him to stand off to a different part of the room because he wasn't an adult yet. At that point, they were not arresting women. They were not arresting uh, children at that time. Um, he, there were about 10, 10 of them that were under age. And uh, after everybody was marched out of there to the concentration camp, they were told to clean the room. After they cleaned the room, they were escorted out of the facility. And there was a raging mob of German women uh, calling literally for their deaths. And they left the room, ran down the street uh, to escape these, these women. Uh, he ended up hiding in a telephone booth. The bottom of the telephone booth was uh, solid, so you couldn't see him. And when the, when the mob uh, passed, he, he had an uncle nearby. He went to his uncle's house. The uncle would not let him in. The uncle was so afraid, uh, he would not let him in. So he just told him to call his parents uh, and let them know that he was safe. And uh, he worked his way he worked his way back to uh, his home. And at that point, his family decided they had to get out. They happened to have, he had a sister, Walter had a sister who was in New York and through his sister, uh, she bought them tickets on the uh, uh, St. Louis, on the MS St. Louis, which many of us know what happened to that. Well, his mother didn't want to go in the St. Louis. So the St. Louis was going directly to Cuba. Uh, everybody had, had a little over 900 Jews on it and everybody, um, had, had entry passes to be able to enter Cuba. Um, when the St. Louis got to Cuba, Cuban government said, you need to pay us $500 more to actually enter the country. Otherwise we won't let you in. Only 30 passengers had the money to pay that $500. So the rest of them were, were left on the ship. Uh, the ship went to Miami, US Coast Guard went out to meet it. People thought the US Coast Guard was gonna escort it into the US. The reality was the US Coast Guard was making sure nobody jumped off and tried to swim ashore. Eventually the St. Louis uh, made it back to Europe and the passengers were divided up between England, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. Those that went to England were relatively safe during the Holocaust. Those that went to the other three countries, many of them died. So Walter's mother, since the ship was going directly to Cuba, she wanted to go on a different ship, uh, which was stopping in New York. So she could see her daughter. She felt it would be the last time she would see her daughter. So they got booked on the Manhattan. And then when they got to New York, they took another ship to Cuba. Same situation, Cuba would not let them in. So they returned back to New York because that's where this ship originated. And they spent four months at Ellis Island before they were finally let into the country. Um, but they, they actually made it in. Um, let's quickly take a uh, quick look at the Olympics. Of course, as everybody knows, the Olympics were, the Nazis wanted to make the Olympics a big show of, you know, how, um, how, how much better the Aryans were uh, than everybody else. Um, Jesse Owens, uh, people are aware, you know, he broke five records. Uh, Hitler would not attend the medal ceremony of any black uh, athlete. Um, so Jesse Owens actually embarrassed uh, the Nazis by, by winning so many medals. But there's another person at the Olympics who was a rower. His name was Nud Christensen. He actually didn't, didn't even participate. He was an alternate for uh, Denmark. But in 1930, uh, in, I'm sorry, in 1943, when uh, Sweden allowed the Jews uh, from Denmark uh, to, to, uh, you know, to have asylum. Um, he actually used his rowing shell and made 17 trips uh, across the waterway between Denmark and Sweden, ferrying one Jewish person on each trip. And eventually 
he, he enlisted the fishermen to help ferry the Jews from Denmark to Sweden. And most of Denmark's population was actually saved uh, from the Nazis uh, by this effort. Uh, he was actually arrested, tortured, um, and eventually he was released uh, because he was part of the resistance movement. Another area where Jews were able to find asylum is in uh, Shanghai. So Shanghai, uh, at that time, it wasn't communist. Uh, if you could get there, you could stay there. No, it, was, it wasn't a great life. Um, you know, it, it was, you know, people there were very poor. They had to figure out how to, how to make money to survive. Um, but nobody was trying to kill them, at least. They weren't being uh, sent into uh, ghettos and concentration camps and what have you. And so, you know, there was uh, a, a small number of Jews, it, actually 20,000 20, uh, managed to get to Shanghai and, uh, and survive the war. There were very few other places that Jews could go. Uh, they could go to um, Dominican Republic, uh, allowed about 1,200 Jews to come in. And um, the Philippines also allowed a similar number of Jews to come in. Beyond that, the, the rest of the world was, was pretty much closed uh, to Jews. Um, as far as Jewish children were concerned, uh, there was, England did allow 10,000 Jewish children uh, to come in. So this was, this was literally the last, uh, the last group that was able to leave uh, Europe. And what happened was, of course, the children could go, the parents could not go. So parents literally had to part from their children uh, to save their children's lives with, you know, with the understanding that they may never see them again. In fact, uh, many of these children became, many of these children became orphans um, as their parents, uh, were killed. Um, so, so as the Nazis realized that, um, that they couldn't get rid of the Jews because nobody would take them, they began, they began first to, as they invaded Poland, <clears throat> they set up these mobile killing squads called Einsatzgruppen. So the Nazis would come and they would conquer a town and then they would round up all the Jews and they would kill them. They would shoot them at close range. They would have them dig pits or have them stand at the edge of a ravine. Um, and, that was, and, and, and that was how they began eliminating the Jews. Well, this actually, believe it or not, had a had a negative impact on the German military morale because they were killing women, children, you know, young people, old people at close range. And so they decided that this was not a good solution because it was actually affecting their military. Um, so what they did was instead they began building ghettos and they began moving the Jews uh, into ghettos. And let me bring us there. And you can see these ghettos were basically prisons, okay? Jews were not allowed out. Non-Jews were not allowed in. Um, food was very uh, sparse. They did not, they, they were given, they, the people who lived in the ghettos were given rations, but the rations were not enough to live on. If you couldn't get extra food, you couldn't survive. And so here you see in the Warsaw ghetto, these people are building the wall to, to seal up the ghetto. These are actually Jewish people building the wall. This is actually a Jewish police officer supervising it. And you, you, know, you wonder why would they build the wall where they're sealing themselves into the ghetto because that was how they got extra food, okay? By working uh, and doing the Nazis bidding, they were able to get more rations that allowed them to survive. 
And in fact, uh, there's a diary that I read, David uh, Sarah Kowiak, Kowiak um, he states in this diary, I was staggered today when I heard about the death of, uh, of our former neighbor in the building, Mr. Kamasuyets. I think his is the first death in the ghetto that left me so deeply depressed. Now keep in mind, the conditions in the ghetto were so bad, and this is in the uh, Lodge ghetto. So I'll bring up a picture of the Lodge. This is, uh, I think this is the Lodge ghetto right here. Nope, it's not. This is, the, this is people going into the Lodge ghetto from work. Um, pe people were dying at a rate of 20 to 25 people every single day in this ghetto from starvation, from disease. And this one person affected him. He said, this man, an absolute athlete before the war, died of hunger here. His iron body did not suffer from any disease. It just grew thinner and thinner every day. And finally, he fell asleep not to wake again. So obviously this person was not able to get work, was not able to get the extra rations needed to survive. And um, this was, uh, this is basically a, a, a mortuary cart that every day would, would go through the Warsaw ghetto and pick up the dead bodies that people put on the sidewalks. Um, and if we go to the last picture I'm gonna show you in the ghetto here is, um, one more. This is, uh, this is an orphanage in the Warsaw ghetto. Uh, the person, his, his name is Janice Korzak. He's, he's the one that ran the orphanage. It's actually, uh, his pen name was Heinrich uh, Goldschmidt. And he wrote children's books, and he was an educator, and he was actually a fairly well-known person in Poland. And because he was well-known, um, the Nazis uh, felt that the publicity of killing him would not be that good, and so supporters of his offered him uh, a, a path out of the ghetto and, and, and out of the uh, country, and he refused. He refused to abandon the children that he was taking care of. And um, literally on August 6, 1942, he was marched with the 200 children from the orphanage along with his assistants and um, sent, to the, uh, sent to the gas chambers. They were all sent to their deaths. Um, you know, he could have survived, but, but he didn't. Um, in another, another scenario or another situation, um, there was a book, uh, Alicia, uh, who she told her story. Her uncle worked in uh, a city hospital in Poland that was under German occupation. So um, he was a heart specialist, but he was the only heart specialist in the hospital. So even though he was banned from working, you saw in that chart earlier, the doctors were not allowed to work. Uh, Jewish doctors were not allowed to work, they would sneak him into the hospital to perform heart procedures. Well, one day there was an SS man who needed a heart operation and he refused. Um, and the other doctors tried to uh, get him to, um, you know, to uh, do the operation. So, so it turned out there were about 400 children being held in a mill that the Nazis were apparently murdering on a, you know, slowly uh, in a fairly cruel way. So he, he said, if you get the children out of that mill back into the ghetto, he would perform the operation. So the Nazis agreed and the children were returned to the ghetto. He performed the operation. The SS soldiers survived. Um, and he went to do his daily rounds to check on the people that he was working with. On the sixth day following the examination, the SS soldier took out his gun and shot him dead. Okay, the hatred that was instilled in these people was so strong that even the doctor that saved this guy's life, uh, he shot dead. All right, so in the meantime, there were a lot of people being put into the ghettos. Uh, the ghettos were filling up. There was no room for the people. So the Nazis needed a new solution. 
and they, they held a conference at this resort. This is uh, the Wansee Villa. It's on a lake on January 20th, 1942. They basically identified where all the Jews of Europe were. They assigned it. This conference, by the way, lasted all of 90 minutes. This was not a debate on what are we going to do to the Jews. This was a, this was a, a direction that we're going to kill all the Jews. And this is each of your responsibilities, all the people who attended the conference, um, as to what you're going to do. For example, uh, Adolf Eichmann was a, was a part of this meeting. His job was to uh, transport people uh, to the death camps. Um, but this is the list of all the Jews throughout Europe, um, 11 million. Now, 5 million were in Russia. So obviously, and some were in England. So, so they weren't able to get them all um, because they didn't uh, conquer all the countries. But unfortunately, they got 6 million Jews. Um, and how did they get them to the camps? So at the museum, we have a boxcar. This is, uh, these were originally used to transport livestock, but these were, this was the car. These were the cars that were used to transport the Jews to the camps. So basically they would put a hundred Jews in this car, no food, no water, they would put one small bucket in the car for as a bathroom, which usually was filled up in the first few hours. And the average trip uh, lasted three days. Many of the Jews actually died on the transport, you know, to the, to the camps. They didn't even make it to the camps. And of course, let me get to what, Once they were at the camp, once the train arrived, they were immediately uh, pulled off the trains. They were separated men from women. They were then uh, told to remove everything, drop their bags, drop their luggage, dro drop their clothing, everything. And they were examined, okay? And there were two lines, you know, one direction meant you were in slave labor. The second direction meant you went immediately to, uh, to the gas chambers and were, uh, were executed. Um, most of the people went to the gas chambers. Um, and certainly any, any children, anybody that was below the age of 16 uh, was immediately sent to the gas chambers. Um, and you can see they would do, and, and, and then even if you were sent to slave labor, that still was no guarantee that you would survive because every day there was a selection. Every day they would look at the, they would look at, have them line up and see who is too weak to continue on or who, who they thought uh, should be killed. So if we go to, um, I wanted to read you this quote here. At Auschwitz, they would have selections, inspections. They would make us take off all of our clothes and stand in line. We would always try to get in the back of the line so we could see what they were picking today. Fat, thin. If they wanted thin, we would walk with our stomachs pushed out. If they wanted fat, we would hold them in. We used to prick our fingers with anything, even a rusty nail. And then we would use our blood like rouge on our cheeks. We wanted to look healthy. We wanted to pass the selection. We wanted to live. Even if it meant another day in the camp, we wanted to live. They would do anything they could to survive. Unfortunately, many of them didn't. And uh, in fact, some of the camps, um, uh, Treblinka, for example, wasn't even built with barracks. They literally, it was, it was pure, it was a pure killing camp. In the case of Auschwitz, there was, uh, there was some work. And so some of the camps, uh, you know, you, if, if you were useful to the Nazis, you could survive for a while. Um, there were resistance movements, you know, people say, you know, what, what, uh, why didn't the Jews fight back? Um, and, 
there were people who did fight back. So here's a, here's a case of two, uh, two Jewish parti partisans in France uh, who were fighting back. Um, uh, you had, uh, of course, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, where literally with Molotov cocktails, uh, they were fighting. They were fighting off tanks and armed Germans. It took the took the Nazis uh, thirty days to suppress the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, and then there were even Germans who uh, who resisted. There was a group called the White Rose uh, Resistance Movement. Um, that was trying to uh, that was trying to you know was against the persecution of the Jews. Unfortunately, they eventually got turned in and discovered, and and they were killed. Um, when the camps were liberated. Uh, at the end of the war, I'm looking for, there it is. Um, you can see, I mean, it, literally people were walking skeletons. Um, it was, as I said, starvation. If you, if you could b get enough food to survive, uh, you, you know, you barely survived. Um, there was also a, uh, let me go back to liberation. So after the war ended, there was a movement of trying to get uh, Jews wanted to go to Israel. Many of the Jews of Europe uh, realized they had no home left for them in Europe. Europe was not a home. They tried to get to uh, Israel any way they could. So there were two. There was two alias. Alia Aleph was the legal immigration, and the Brit and the British uh, government had uh, Palestine locked down, so very few people were allowed to legally uh, immigrate. Uh, to Palestine. Uh, and then there was Ali Abet. Ali Abet was the illegal immigration. So uh, Jews were buying up surplus ships. They were loading up uh, Jewish refugees and they were trying to run the British blockade uh, to get as many Jews uh, into Palestine as possible. Um, of course, those that didn't uh, make it got sent to uh, camps in, in typically in Cyprus. Um, and they had to wait until uh, Israel was established before they could finally, uh, finally get into the country. So we talked about, um, talked about uh, at the very beginning when we we're talking about anti-Semitism, uh, after the war, there were trials, the Nuremberg trials, where some of the Nazis were actually convicted and uh, executed uh, as a result of, you know, their crimes, uh, which were, you know, horrific. Um, but this is the one I wanted to bring your attention to, Julius Stryker. You remember he was the person who uh, was leading that conference when we talked about anti-Semitism. Julius Stryker wasn't a soldier. He didn't run a concentration camp. He didn't kill anybody. He didn't fire any bullets, but he published the anti-Semitic newspaper, Der Sturmer, which got the people of the country to hate Jews. They, couldn't have, they could not have committed the crimes that they committed without getting their people uh, on board. And he was actually sentenced to death. Uh, he, and he was, he, he was executed um, as a result of uh, what he did. Um, so we usually like to end these tours on a positive note, um, as positive as you can get uh, in the Holocaust. And we have what we call the, um, the upstanders gallery. So upstanders, we, we, we basically classify, there are four types of people that were around during the Holocaust. There were the perpetrators. Those were the Nazis. There were the victims. 
the Jews, predominantly the Jews, but also as we talked about the gypsies, the homosexuals, etc. They were the bystanders, the people who basically did nothing, said nothing, just kind of allowed it all to happen. And then there were the upstanders, the people who took action and tried to uh, tried to to save people. And they did so at risk of their own lives. I mean, most of these upstanders. Um, it was very difficult for them. So Raoul Wallenberg, he was, um, he was a Swedish ambassador. Uh, I believe he was in Hungary. I think he was a Swedish ambassador to Hungary, um, but uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe. And he issued 4,500 Swedish documents uh, to, to basically put the Jew, these Jews under Swedish protection. When the war ended, he went to the Russian, the Russians happened to conquer the country that he was in uh, to tell him of uh, what he did and you know uh, what his position was and he was never heard from again. Uh, so he disappeared. Um, Tuvia Bielski, so Tuvia and, uh, and, his, and his three brothers, he and his family own, were on a farm. They were the only Jews in this town in Poland. So of course, when the Nazis came, they killed their parents. They killed, I think, two or three of his siblings. Uh, and three of them managed to escape, ran to the woods uh, to hide. Um, they lived in the area. They knew the woods very well. Um, Tuvia was um, committed to, they, they, they encountered some other Jews uh, uh, who were also hiding and he took them in. His brothers were like, hey, we don't even have enough food for himself. And he, he basically said that any Jew that reached their camp, they were going to take in um, and, and, and save them. And basically he was able to save uh, over 1,200 Jews. By the end of the war, his camp had grown to over 1,200 Jews uh, that he was able to save. This is a shirt he wore while he was in the camp. Uh, Chien Sugihara, he was a, a Japanese diplomat. Uh, he issued between 2,100 and 3,500 Japanese transit visas to Jews. Uh, and that, he did that against his country's orders. Japan, who of course was allied with the Nazis, um, ordered him not to do that. After the war, he was dismissed from the foreign service for insubordination. And uh, well, Meep Guys, uh, of course, we know she, she was the secretary of uh, Otto Frank. She was the one that brought the Frank family food and uh, other materials to help them survive during their, their um, year and a half or two years in hiding. Uh, Irina Sendler, she was a uh, social worker and she would go into the ghetto and she would rescue a couple of children at a time. She would pose as a nurse. Um, she would have to convince the parents to part with their children. Um, and, and basically, you know, her, her story was that you're all gonna die. You, you, you may have a chance to save your children. Let me try and save your children. And she would take them out one or two at a time. And she had families that were willing to take them in and hide them. And, um, and the other thing is she documented their origins so that after the war, um, they would know who they were, which not everybody did who rescued, uh, who rescued Jewish children. And she was able to save 2,500 people, 2,500 Jewish children. She was actually uh, arrested by the Nazis. Uh, she was tortured. She did not give them any information. She was actually sent to be executed and the person who was um, running the facility that she was in was bribed and uh, he let her out. And so she survived. And they asked her, why did you do it? What was, what was your reasoning? And she said, her father told her that if you see someone drowning, you have to save them. And she said, what if I can't swim? And he said, it doesn't matter. You still have to save them. Okay, and the last one I want to tell you about, which we don't actually have a um, picture of, 
is uh, Master Sergeant Roddy Edmonds, an American. There aren't very many Americans recognized at the um, at Yad Vashem, you know, at the uh, you know for the righteous uh, non-Jews. Uh, he was taken. He and his group were and his and his uh, unit were taken prisoner at the Battle of the Bulge. And one day he got a notice. He was this. He was the senior uh, American of the group uh, as a master sergeant. One day he got a notice by the uh, Nazis that uh, tomorrow's roll call, you just send the Jews out, nobody else. So there were twelve hundred of them. Uh, Roddy had his entire group go out. Nazi, uh, the Nazi major went up to him and said, I told you, I just want the Jews. And he, he, he said, in this company, we are all Jews. And he screamed at the guy, said, they can't all be Jews. And, uh, he took his gun out and pointed it at Roddy's head. And he said, you give me the Jews or I will kill you right now. And Roddy said to him, you guys are losing the war. He said, after the war is over, there's going to be, there's going to be a trial. You're, you're going to, you know, people are going to be brought up on war crimes. If you kill me now, you'll be one of them. And the guy put his gun away and, and left. And so the Jews in his troop were saved. But that wasn't the case for other, all American uh, groups that uh, got taken prisoner. Not all of them did what Roddy did. But finally, I'm just going to leave you with a quote. And this is a quote from a Polish author, Zofia Kosik, who said, whoever remains silent in the face of murder becomes an accomplice of the murder. He who does not condemn, condones. And with that, I'll ask if anybody has any questions. Probably the best way to do questions would be to type them into the um, chat. Let's see if there are any questions. Ah, Budapest, I assume that's for, um, that was for uh, Raul Wallenberg. Yeah, the movie Defiance is about the Bielskis. Uh, somebody posted that, so it is, it is a good movie. Um, he actually went to Israel uh, for a, a, a few years. Um, he was a taxi cab driver when he was in Israel. Uh, and then he had uh, an uncle who survived and went to America and had a business and uh, he went over there to work. So it's, you know, these were, or he was an ordinary person who just did an extraordinary thing Yes. Yeah, some of them uh, moved to Newark, New Jersey, and got into the trucking business. And mm. as you can imagine, the people in the trucking business aren't exactly the Boy Scouts. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't a Boy Scout. He, he, and, was, and he, was said he was the toughest of all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what they went through was unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. So I got, uh, has his hand up. I'm going to unmute you. Okay, Elliot, you can unmute yourself. I think he has to confirm the unmute. Yeah, he does. You have to confirm your unmute, uh, Elliot. So somebody is asking, Adrian is asking, did the government of any other country try to intercede in the German affairs? Uh, no, no, the other, the other countries didn't. We had, uh, we had a conference called the Evian Conference, uh, took place in Evian, France. This was where uh, all the allies were, gonna, were getting together to um, basically figure out how they were going to solve the Jewish uh, refugee problem, you know, provide asylum for the, for the Jews that were being persecuted in Germany. And they literally walked away with everybody, only the Dominican Republic at that conference was the only country uh, willing to take in any Jews. And you had to pay. You had to pay to get in there. They, 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 they didn't do it for free. Um, America, Canada, all the other countries said, no, we, you know, we, we're, we're, you know, it's a bad thing that's happening to the Jews, but you can't come here. There was a great piece on Roddy Edmonds, I believe it was on 60 Minutes. Mm. And you might be able to get some pictures of him through 60 Minutes and add him to that gallery. 
Yeah, that would be nice to have him in the I believe gallery. it was his son who was the subject of the interview. His son actually came to speak. Uh, that's how I found out about the story. His son came to speak at the Florida Holocaust Museum a few months ago. Uh, and it was interesting because Roddy never told his, his family about it. He never told anybody about it. Yeah, that was the gist of the story. Yeah, what happened was uh, when he died, some of the people that he saved became successful business people. And they were reaching out to Roddy to see if he needed any help. And, and so they reached out to his son and that's how, that's how his son found out about it. Uh, Benny Sommerfeld asked a question. The question was, uh, is, it, is that this? Yes. Um, so you took us on, is that displayed in the Florida Museum? Yes. So um, most of what we saw are actually, is actually on display at the Florida Holocaust Museum. Um, so we didn't see everything. We, we saw a subset of the, you know, of, of all the exhibits. There's really too much to cover in, in an hour's time. Um, and of course, there are other floors that have other exhibits. Um, uh, you know, I haven't been there recently. I know they've recently reopened at the, uh, you know, we had an Anne Frank exhibit uh, up in the museum, um, which specifically focused on her story. Uh, and then we've had some art exhibits. We've, we've had, uh, we've actually had uh, civil rights exhibits, um, you know, which, which that's been virtualized as well. Uh, but it's a great museum. In fact, there are actually three accredited Holocaust museums in the United States. Uh, of course, one of them is the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Ours is another. And then the third one is out in Houston. Those are the three uh, museums that are actually accredited by the, uh, by the government. Perhaps it was not accredited, but the one in Skokie, Illinois, is quite well done as well. Oh, that's great. That's, there's a lot of museums out there. There's a, a, a lot of museums out there. Uh, yes. Adrian, you have Adrian. a question? Let me unmute you. Adrian, you have to respond. Yep. Uh, yes. Um, did you mention the, the Richmond Holocaust Museum at all? Richmond, Virginia? Uh, I'm not familiar with, no, I'm not familiar with that one. Okay, they, they have a a, a car just like you have there. I mm -hmm. guess they were collected from, but they have um, a life-sized Nuremberg courtroom. Oh, really? Apparently, it's the only one in the world that looks like the one in Nuremberg. Hmm. Wax, wax figures and everything. Yeah, wow. So, anyway, fascinated by, by um, you know, your museum, and hope one day to get down there. Didn't know it existed, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great it's I mean it's a great museum. It's also a great city. So. <laughs> So yeah. if you if you do come down, feel you know, plan to spend a little bit of time because I think uh, I think I think you'll enjoy it. Okay, thank Libby, you. Anyway, Libby and Mike, you're next. Yes, uh, we have a daughter and son-in-law who live in Richmond, and the the Holocaust Museum there is is really really nice. And that courtroom, the Nuremberg courtroom, is really something to see. But mm. what I wanted to say is that that we we lived most of our lives in Ridgewood, New Jersey, and Ridgewood was the the childhood home. <laughs> of Varian Fry, who was the first of five Americans recognized as righteous among the nations. He ran a rescue network in Vichy, France. And mm. I'm wondering if he's, uh, I, I'm assuming he's probably mentioned somewhere because your museum there looks like it's very, very uh, comprehensive uh, uh, historical record of everything that happened. So I'm sure his name must be in there because- uh, he, He's not on the board. He's not on the board of, you know, the, there were 12 people on the uh, board of, of, of um, the righteous that we were seeing. There's, there's 12 people that are showing up there. So he's not one of the 12, but, you know, obviously- well, Supposedly you know, there were five Americans and he was the first one to be named, but- yeah, that's what I've heard. I, I've heard that there were only five. So, and, and Roddy is, of course, one of the five. Um, and as it, and and the reason I, as I said, the reason I know the story is because they had an event where his son was brought in to to speak uh, to the group. Um, so it was a very good event. You know, we we have uh, there, there's still a few, a number of Holocaust survivors that live in the, uh, in the Southwest Florida area. So 
A lot of them um, come to the museum to speak. They speak to, well, obviously not in COVID times, but before pre-COVID times, they came to the museum to speak to uh, predominantly the school groups that come through. So, um, you know, we had a lot of school groups that uh, came through the museum, which hopefully will, when this is all over, we'll have them again. I'd like to mention that I belong to a uh, dis book discussion group and we just finished discussing a young adult book called The Assignment by Lisa Weimer about um, high school students who in upstate New York, a number, not too long ago, but a number of years ago, were given the assignment to debate the Wannasee Conference. And uh, one student from that school and a uh, an acquaintance of hers um, rebelled against that and had to bring that to the commissioner of education and all of the hate that they still um, were up against, all of the terrible things that were being written about them by their town. Um, and there are a number of schools that are uh, using this book now for their young adults as a uh, Holocaust. Um, study, even though it is a novel, it's written as a novel, it's a very interesting way to get this across to young people of all religions. Well, if you want to read a, a good school uh, book related book, um, I'd recommend Life in a Jar. Uh, so Life in a Jar is a book, it's about Irina Sendler. But it's actually, there was a school in St. Louis and it was uh, a group of high school kids that were, that were they were in like a, a special history program and they took this on as a project uh, to research. And they were the ones that actually brought her story out. And Life in a Jar is a reference to the names that she would, you know, she would write the names of children. She wrote them on toilet paper and would put them in jars and bury them in her backyard. <laughs> um, so when the day came when the war ended and these, these children would know who they were. Uh, George. Uh, incidentally, last night, our synagogue, Temple Bet Shalom, and our sister synagogue, Or Shalom, had a Zoom meeting with uh, Rabbi Alvin Winehouse, who is the rabbi of the Or Shalom, and his father was, uh, uh, I guess, the, the rabbi of the Vilna, one of the Vilna yeshivas. And he presented uh, an hour-long hour presentation about what happened to these 400 kids in the yeshiva that managed to escape out of Vilna go, by getting permission from uh, uh, Sugihara by getting transport visas to get to the, going all the way across the, Russia on the Orient Express and ended up in, uh, in Japan. And then they, it's a whole story of how his father survived with his 400 kids wow. that he took with himself. So we hope to put it up on our website or some other link because he recorded this uh, presentation because it is personal representation of his family and how he, how he survived. When you get the, if you get that link, send it to Alan and Alan will share it with me because I'd love to see oh. it. Okay. Any well, other questions? you know, we are in a, this we is Temple Bet Shalom in Hamden. So we hope to put uh, a link on our website or somehow get okay. it out to the public. Thank you, George. Uh, next, Marilyn, I'm going to unmute you. You have to okay. click. Who uh, wrote uh, the book Life in the Jar? Uh, um, let me think. Uh, the reason, Jack Myers. And the reason I know the name, because I'm really bad with names, <laughs> is because uh, I have a, a friend who's a Holocaust survivor uh, whose name is Jack Myers and I thought it was him. And I, and I sent him an email when I read the book and, and just told him, hey, I read your book and it was excellent. And he informed me it wasn't his. Of course, uh, when I got to the end of the book and it described the author, then I realized it wasn't yeah. his. My daughter teaches high school in New Haven, Connecticut. And um, she was just 
horrified when she found out the kids don't learn about the Holocaust in school. Yeah, so yeah, she she teaches English and she takes it upon herself every year to have um, a section on the Holocaust. She has her kids read night. And when she can find someone who's a survivor, she'll have them come into the school and talk to the kids. That's great. Yeah, there's only, I believe there's only 21 states that have mandatory Holocaust education. Uh, interestingly it was enough, Florida. Florida was one of the first ones that, uh, that, that embraced that. Um, and, and I don't think any of the, the New England states have it. Wow. Can I, and George, I know you from um, Beth Shalom. Okay. We'll keep the uh, personal <laughs> things aside, if you don't mind. Uh, Elliot? Yeah. I, there's another boxcar in the United States. It's in Whitwell, Tennessee. And the story of Whitwell, Tennessee is centered around the kids in the eighth grade could not begin to imagine what six million of anything meant. And so they began to collect paper clips and they finally wound up with 10 million paper clips. Uh, people heard about this wonderful experience. I visited that school and uh, they sent a box car to them, courtesy of one of the societies supporting Holocaust education. And the children have made a real tribute to the Holocaust. And I think this started about 12, 15 years ago and they've maintained it ever since. The, the box, being in that box car, I can only tell you is a very meaningful experience. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but um, the box car at the Florida Holocaust Museum, the doors remain closed. Um, and they do that on purpose because uh, they believe, they feel that it would be very traumatic for some of the survivors to actually see the inside of the box car. And so they've, they've made a commitment that as long as there are survivors alive, they will not open the doors of that box car. And um, if you've been to the US Holocaust Museum, you actually walk through uh, the box car that they have uh, during the tour. Are there any other, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I wanna thank Eric, first of all, for their tremendous presentation. Great job. Thank you for inviting it's me. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you all for participating. Uh, I have placed on chat a, uh, a, a site that you can click on if you'd like to give a donation in Eric's honor. Also, again, to remind you, you can go on fjmc.org and uh, slash webinars. You can find our past and present, uh, past and future, sorry, uh, seminars. Uh, we will be sending you uh, a question, a short questionnaire. We hope you'll answer it, send it back to us. And again, I want to thank Eric so much and thank you all for participating. Stay safe, stay healthy. Have a wonderful new year. Thanks again. Have a good night. Thank you all.